had a wonderful ability to connect with people emotionally, to understand the world outside politics, which then gave him a better understanding of the world inside politics. I think he was an extraordinary man. He was principled, he was funny, he was charming. Sincere and very, very clever, and occasionally a bit irascible. The case of a former priest who wants to become a Scottish MP is likely to lead to the law being changed. One night we were coming home from work, it was quite late, and we were passing St Mary's in Clapham Common where he had been a, a priest and he said, Siobhan, I want to stand for Parliament, I want to, stand, I want to be the MP for Greenock, but I've got to change the law. I remember it was one of these bizarre sort of overhangs from the old days that, that um, former Catholic priests couldn't become, or Catholic priests couldn't become MPs and, and you know it's just one of these things that no one had ever got round to changing. John David Cairn, Scottish Labour Party candidate, 14,000. Yeah! I am extremely honoured and humbled to be the first person from this constituency to represent this constituency. David was Labour to the core, he was New Labour to the core. He understood working class aspiration in a way that many other people in the party didn't and still don't. I've watched David for many years, both from inside the political village and more recently at RBS from outside of it. Very committed, very intelligent guy, you know, pleasure to do business with and no hesitation for us to support this foundation, uh, not least because as the Greenock MP, a town that's really important to us, hundreds of our staff working there, serving customers across the UK. We had very difficult times and throughout all of it he was just absolutely professional in how he dealt with us and represented his own people. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker all appearances to the contrary, the Scotland office is a remarkably slim and lean uh, organisation. <laughs> the qualities that David had, which, which I thought would make him a good minister and indeed did make him a good minister, was that he was, he was hard working, very, you know, he analysed problems properly. He had a very nice manner about him, I mean, people liked him. And, you know, to get on with the politics of Northern Ireland is never easy. Uh, and he succeeded in getting on with both sides, frankly, across the divide. And that also was never easy. Um, but he did it very well. And when he doubled up doing the Scottish office at the same time. He was somebody who was on top of the detail, knew the arguments, and was more than willing to take those arguments to others. You've got to hand it to the SNP. One thing they do, and one thing they do really well, is they come up with slogans that rhyme. Who can forget Scotland free by 93? Scotland free by 2003, and now we are to have Scotland free by STV. <laughs> he had this incredibly quick and sometimes quite acerbic wit. Um, but I always thought, you know, that that was really part of his appeal. He was quite combative, he enjoyed the, the, the clash, um, but he also didn't do it in a personal manner. And it was possible to have a fierce debate with David uh, and not fall out with him. David Cairns, for me, was an exceptional politician. He was a tremendous constituency MP for Greenock and Inverclyde. Uh, he served as a minister and he made decisions that were not beneficial to his own uh, career as a matter of, of principle, which is rare nowadays in, in politics. I'm somebody who believes, actually, that the worst day of a Labour government is better than the best day of a Tory government or an SNP government. So to find myself in this situation is, is actually pretty wretched and the last place I ever thought I would find myself. But in the last few days, few weeks, perhaps even few months, I have come to the conclusion that the way we are at the moment, not just the opinion polls, but the by-election defeats and the whole series of circumstances that surround our party at the moment that we do need the opportunity to clear the air and to have that leadership debate and discussion. He was completely disbelieved. He had been through a lot. He joined the priesthood and he'd left it. Uh, he 
was um, a gay man. He had a lot of challenges in his life and they just told him that he had to be the person he was and therefore he couldn't utter what he couldn't believe. He didn't want to go, he didn't choose to go, um, but they pushed him. But once he was pushed, he could only be the person he was. It's uh, a very difficult thing to do and not popular with the leader that you say something like that in respect of. But I, I really think it's important to stress for him, I know, because he, you know, he didn't think his going was going to produce a, you know, Gordon stepping down or anything, but he just had this view that... that that this is what should happen, and then he said it. But he would have said it to me if he thought it. I mean, I've no doubt about that at all. He was recognised across the political spectrum for having made a very honest, principled uh, decision. And afterwards, he didn't mope or uh, go in the huff. He got on with things again and, and explored the many things that motivated him as a politician. He continued his interest in, in, in HIV and AIDS prevention in the developing world. He took a strong interest in broadcasting. He was very interested, particularly in the independent broadcasting sector in Scotland. He had an exceptional knowledge of our sector in a way which I have not seen in any other politician. He had a real curiosity and he also had a, a, a vision for the, for the future and he managed to put those two together in an exceptional way. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I always remember when David stood up because you knew he was going to say something quite interesting and, and you always knew that when he sat down I would be thinking, I wish I had said that. In the last few weeks the government has rebranded ASBOs as CBOs, <laughs> renamed control orders as TPIMS and rechristened curfews as overnight residence requirements. <laughs> Does he not realise that no amount of rebranding will disguise the fact that a government preparing to cut police numbers by 10,000 will be seen as anything other than weak on antisocial behaviour, reckless on terrorism and soft on crime? In, in the space of a few seconds, he just completely deflated the government's uh, policies and proposals and sat down again with a big grin on his face, knowing that he'd done well. And he, he really had. Order, order. I regret to have to report to the House the death of David Cairns, member for Inverclyde. David was a most assiduous member, serving as Parliamentary Under Secretary of State and Minister of State in the last Parliament, and much respected by the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I begin uh, by expressing my own uh, personal sadness and shock at the death of David Cairns? Uh, I knew David pretty well. I went with him on a trip to the United States some years ago and spent some time with him. Uh, I know he was principled, he was gentle in the best sense of the word. Uh, he was genuinely liked and respected in all parts of this house. I don't have any doubts whatsoever that had he lived, not only would the causes that he cared about have continued to have one of the most able, articulate champions they could hope for, but that at some point in the future he would be back at the highest levels of government and politics. I remember one of the last conversations I had with him, which was about what he was going to be doing back as Chair of Labour Friends of Israel, and it was a conversation which was warm and funny, and, but most of all, I felt this was somebody who had a huge amount still to offer. A huge, a huge kind of life in politics and his personal life ahead of him. I always thought that David had a big future in the, in the Labour Party and I think if, if, if he'd lived then he would have been very much part of bringing the Labour Party back to power again. Yeah.